So let's just start it um, the from so lecture two uh, from dynamics. Okay, let's start there um, and then do the collision chord to model and and move on from there. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, so all this stuff is on the uh, the course website and the, the lectures, I put them up in the last day or two. Um, essentially just going through Cladin Cortem, boom, boom, distribution simulations. And then we're gonna do like Cladin Cortem on steroids where you've got more heterogeneity, okay? Um, in uh, across product, I mean, you have a different aggregation and that, and that induces a lot more heterogeneity acro across products, okay? Which adds more heterogeneity across firms as well. Okay, and then we'll go through that. That that brings in some more advanced continuous time stuff, which I think is useful to to to, to be aware of and, and comfortable with. Okay, so so yeah, but all this stuff is um, on the website, so you can go back and check it there. Check it out there. Also, the uh, in terms of the uh, the videos. Okay, all right. All of a sudden, this is something about string theory. We don't need to read about string theory. Sorry, it's like, I just like decided that I was gonna look at a different window. We wanna look at that window. Okay, so um, I'm gonna kind of do whiteboard stuff uh, for now, and then uh, you can refer back. And then the, the videos themselves, um, they'll be on Twitch, but they, they expire. So, so I'll probably just delete them at some point and transfer them to YouTube. And when I transfer them to YouTube, it doesn't. The chat is not is not recorded, so I'm just I'm actually recording on my own computer, as well. So the chat is not going to stick around. Um, I figure it's probably just best to keep the chat ephemeral, um, and then uh, but the videos will stick around. I'll edit out the 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 conversations at the beginning and the end if I don't think they're super generally important, um, and I'll edit out anything I say that's like really stupid. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. Mostly everything will be there. Okay. Um, cool. So then, uh, let me just. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's do this. Okay. We're gonna do cladding quartum. Um. I have a whiteboard. I have a little stylus here. Uh. My. Handwriting is less good here than on the board for like text, but we don't really use that much text anyway on the board, so that's fine. Um, in terms of math, I think it's it's okay. All right. Um, okay, so let's let's fire this up. So we uh, cutting court term is, is is really just most of the product market stuff is the same as as the created destruction model that we looked at. Okay, so I guess I. Um, Yeah, I didn't even, yeah, so I'm not even going to really repeat that. So, but, but in the background, maybe I should just be explicit. So in, in the background, you know, we have some log aggregation, okay, of these uh, YIs. Okay, I don't know if I should put parentheses on here. So uh, we have some log log aggregation of all these different products. And because it's log log, that means we're going to get limit pricing. Okay, and so... This is a creative destruction model, so we have a, a fixed mass of product lines that firms are jockeying for, um, and uh, they have you know each firm has some technology in that product QI, which tells you their their labor productivity. Okay, um, and then okay, uh, so sort of you know you have labor. Um, uh, integral from zero to one of li di is equal to p. So you have a certain amount of production labor, okay? That gets split in between the different product lines that each of those has their own productivity, which produces yi, and then that maps into um, total output, okay? Um, and then you also have like, you know, one equals p plus r. So you, you have uh, a split between uh, production labor and research. Okay, now, so that's that's all standard. That's stuff we did in the creative destruction model. So we should know that, and we know the implications of that. Okay, so in particular, let's just map those out so that we have them down in handy. All right. Um, 
what are we going to get? So, uh, let's see. So, so, so we get, um, the, the price. Okay. PI is going to be the marginal cost, uh, of their next nearest competitor. Okay. Um, remember marginal cost here is, is W over Q. Right, so it's the wage divided by your productivity, so it's going to be QI. Now their next nearest competitor, though, has that one plus lambda. So lambda is the step size, remember? So their next nearest competitor is them, but a little bit lower by a factor of one plus lambda. And lambda is, you know, lambda is uh, greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, so then, yeah, so this is going to be like one plus lambda times W over QI. All right. Um, and then uh, in terms of demand, we know because of that log log, that revenue, it's constant, right? PI times YI equal to Y. So then YI here is gonna be uh, I over PI, okay? Which is gonna be, you know, Y over one plus Lambda <clears throat> times QI over W. All right. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through this pretty quickly because you guys you guys have seen this before, but I want to just get it down for official purposes. Um, okay, and then from there you can work out li, which is just taking yi and killing off the q. So that's y over one plus lambda times one over w. Okay, and then from there you can work out profit too. So profit is revenue y minus okay, well, profit is pi yi minus w times li. We know that revenue is y, w li is y over one plus lambda. Hence, combining the fractions, you get lambda over one plus lambda times y, okay? So that's 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 profit pi i. Okay, so now we got profit. That's good. Proportional output. We got we got labor. You know we got it all, all right? Um, and then so then, but what's going to be you know important for us? Okay. Uh, well, okay. So let's just you know main result, main conclusions. Okay, I'm not gonna write that, main conclusions, let's say. Okay, so uh, main conclusions are we need profits. Okay, we, and we've calculated, I'm gonna, we're gonna be normalizing stuff. Okay, so when I normalize stuff by output Y, I'm gonna use tilde, which is standard. Um, so then that normalized profit is just lambda over one plus lambda. Okay, and that's just saying, if you have a zero step size, that's per trend with similar with the same price, you have zero profits because you're pricing at marginal cost. As your step size gets larger and larger, you become effectively um, a monopolist or close to it because uh, your competitor's way back and your profit gets larger and larger and approaches one. Okay, which is the most you can get, right? That's that's why. All right, so um, that's going to be important, and then uh, so. The other thing that's going to be important is, let me add in some stuff here. The other thing that's going to be important, I'll do this too, is uh, the production, the relationship between production and wages. Okay. So, you know, from here you can see uh, that Li is, if you combine this as a W over Y, this is just going to be one over one plus lambda times one over w tilde. Okay, so the labor is evenly split across uh, all of the product lines, and then the wage just determines. So, like the higher the wage, the less demand for labor there is. Okay, if you integrate this over over all the li of which there is a unit mass, then this just turns into a p. So because there's a unit mass of product lines and we all use the same one, the same amount of labor for each one, you get this. Okay, so then let's just 
write this over here. So now p is equal to one of them plus lambda times. So this is this is telling you, given a certain wage, how much production labor is there going to be given everything that's happening in the uh, production side. Okay. So like these are kind of just the two big important things that we need, and everything else is kind of like we don't we can forget about it a little bit. Okay. And that's this is this is largely coming from stuff that we kind of already knew uh, from the creative destruction model. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is y is equal to q times p, wherein log of q is this integral of the productivities. Okay, so you can you can derive that um, from from here. Basically, you use if you integrate uh, this and use what we know about w, you can get that y equals q times p. So this is saying, well, output is just the product of amount of labor that you're using times how productive that labor is. Okay, and then in this case, it happens to be a very clean, you know, y equals qp with that same aggregator. Okay, so that's pretty much all we need to know from the production side is this set of results here. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know if I, sometimes I forget and draw things behind my own head here and that's, yeah, that's not, just let me know if I need to scroll. Okay. So, uh, all right. So now so that's sort of like, you know, we already knew that. Okay. So now let's 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 try and sort of up the ante and and, and uh, introduce some more exciting stuff and stuff that's gonna give us a real notion of of firms. Okay, so before firms were just you know single product firms and that was it. Okay, so now firms are gonna be expanding and contracting. They're they're doing you know there is still entry. Okay, and when you enter, you enter as a one product firm. But then you, you start doing more research and you can capture more and more products. That's going to give us a real firm size distribution, which we could potentially compare against the data. OK, so. Um, all right. So, so we need to do that. So we're going to call this since this is like the new part. Um, OK, I got a question here. Uh, Yu Chung, uh, is the definition of Q the same as creative destruction model? Yes, it is. So yeah, so the whole product side is actually the same as creative destruction because um uh kind of yeah like the products like the the way that things are going to work out is that the products effectively just kind of operate within themselves and then like the firms sit on top of that and they're going to say okay I, I captured a product which means i get this flow rate of profit and you know this amount of labor and, and blah 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 so so the product market is really staying exactly the same the, what's going to be different is how those products are allocated across firms okay um, so the products are just constantly being turned over and stolen from firm to firm. Okay, that's that's the dynamic. Um, <clears throat> so let's call this incumbent innovation. Okay, so um, so what we need to define here is a a production function for uh, for research. Okay, and so you, the firm does research. If they succeed, they steal a random product from another firm. Okay. And they increment the quality in such a way by a factor of lambda that they get the same profit pi tilde normalized as, as everyone else. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's a you know, it's a little funky because it's like you get you 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 steal product, you improve the quality, but then you just get the same profit as if as the, the old firm was getting, and and that's that's a result of this log log aggregation. That that's a particular result from limit pricing. Um, if you had like a random draw for lambda. Then yeah, you know, if you drew a higher lambda, you get more profit, and vice versa. So that's it's just a simplification, but it's we we're actually going to change that when we go to to cut in court to Mach two. All right, so um, okay, so incumbent innovation. What does this look like? So here's what we're going to have. We're going to have capital X. I'm going to draw this super big for emphasis. That's innovation at the firm level. For a, for a given firm, that's their innovation rate. This is a Poisson process okay uh memoryless independent id process where things over a short time interval have a prob probability of arriving of delta times x okay um then c this is capital c and the, these things are going to go lowercase eventually so that's why i'm drawing them you know super large capital c is uh 
research spending. The other thing, the other thing where it's startups, they just use the word spend rather than spending. I don't understand that. Um, okay, so uh, maybe you haven't seen that, but I have. So uh, we need to relate these two. And then by relating these two, we're going to make a, in this case, let's we're, we're going to make a production function. Okay, so we're going to say, I ch if I choose to invest C, how much uh, X am I going to generate as a flow? Okay, here's the cladding quartum. As I'm going to posit it. Uh, is research spending entirely on labor or just R times W? Um, it's entire so research is all labor based. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a, regardless of whether it's a research by incumbents or entrants, it's always just you're spending a certain amount of labor. So when you put on the cost, you will yeah, you'll you'll have a W on there too. Okay, so now here, yeah. So so let's we'll when we'll see it's sim the 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 entry side is very similar to before. The this this side is a little different, but it is still going to be entirely a, a labor based research. Okay, so our so this is our our. Um, so actually, yeah, so this isn't spending, this is research, this is research labor. Okay, so that's, yeah, that way I don't have to put a W in here. Uh, that's a good point. Um, okay, so then uh, this is going to be alpha. I couldn't decide what to do. The alpha is a constant, okay? It's not the labor share or the capital share. Uh, times C raised to the eta. And now we're going to put n to the one minus dot alpha eta. Okay, so this is um, I guess we should call this a function proper uh, x of c given a size n firm. Okay, so you're a size n firm. You spend c on innovation. You produce x uh, a flow rate of innovation. Okay, so um, this is a Cobb Douglas, right? The Cobb Douglas aggregation of your spending and your number of products. Okay. So the way to think about it is just that, um, you know, firms, when they expand, they get a new product line, but they also get kind of a new, like more capacity for research and it goes up and it's Cobb Douglas. So it goes up and it scales up in exactly the way we want. Okay. So they, they get, they get more capacity for research when they get more products. Maybe they're getting more demand information. Maybe they're getting more, you know, market analysis or something, or maybe they're just experimenting and they're, they're able to prototype and experiment more easily uh, and stuff like that. That in the end is going to give them sort of like this source of like innovative capacity. And then they of course have to also spend stuff in terms of uh, labor, uh, have researchers that also goes in and then it's the Cobb Douglas. Okay. So um, yeah, that's our, that's our aggregate firm production function. Bounds on eta. Eta's got to be between zero and one. Um, so yeah, it's got to be between zero and one. And we'll see that why that is in a, in a second. Okay. Um, all right. So if we, this is aggregated, this is aggregate firm production function. Uh, decreasing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We want to have a concave at the, at the per, at per capita level. We'll see it. It's concave the per product level. Um, what keeps us converging to a single firm? Um, good question. So, so firms are, yeah, okay. So you're saying well, if your innovative capacity goes up, when you innovate, you're going to just go out of control. Okay. It, it turns out we're going to get a constant rate of innovation. So let's see, why is that? Um, let's, let's go to per capita. Okay. So think about per capita X over N. This is capital X over N. Maybe like put like these things on it. All right. Uh, capital X. I guess they're not supposed to be like that, but whatever. Uh, it looks like a skull and crossbones or something. And then um, it's going to be what? It's going to be alpha C to the eta and to the minus R. See, that, that was, that's what I get for choosing alpha to not be the Cobb Douglas share. That's, yeah, okay. Um, which is alpha C over N to the eta. Okay. So, you know, X, X over N per product innovation rate is some function of the per product 
uh, labor, research labor, okay? Um, and then if we, if we use new notation, so now this is a lowercase x is equal to alpha, uh, lowercase c, oh no, lowercase c, raised to the eta. Okay, so then this is, this is our per capita uh, uh, production function. Now this is saying you can produce a uh, rate of innovation of x per product if you spend a certain amount per product. So there's no, what this does is it makes it so that products act as if they're linearly separable. Okay, that each, it's like each product line is a little lab that can replicate itself at the same rate. Okay, now, um, then in terms of the, the, going back to Jordan's question, what dynamics is this induced for the distribution? Well, um, you know, firms are gonna be expanding at a certain rate, X, right? They're, if each product, product line is generating a new product at rate x, then that means that it's overall the firm is, is going to grow at rate x, okay? Um, they're also going to get things stolen from them, okay? And so that's kind of come back at them. Other firms are doing this and stealing stuff from them. So with, without any entry, it's just, it's kind of a closed system, okay? Uh, economic means small x. That's the, the per product line innovation rate. So the total innovation rate is going to be capital X or N times little x, but each product line has a little lab that generates innovation, basically, and that is, well, that's going to end up being constant in equilibrium. Okay, so that's, it's a normalized, basically we're just, we're just bringing, we're normalizing things for firms back down to the product line level, because that ends up being super useful for kind of like generating the distribution. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, so then, so why does it, why does it not just, you just run away? So if you had no entry, that may still be true. You might still, it's like a random walk, binary random walk. I think you might still get complete divergence. Once you have entry, that keeps things under control because then you start chipping away at firms, even if they're large with, with, with creative destruction and you start introducing size one firms. So it's like, I think entry we'll see will, uh, ensure that the distribution doesn't just completely, you know, doesn't go like Amazon or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, but, but, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. We'll see how it works out. Um, once we, once we can start getting there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that, so, so really what's important is, is this, okay. Um, so, so let's call it, you know, we can, yeah, and and then the other thing that's going to be important is jumping over here. Um, I guess I'll just yeah, let's go over here. Uh, the other thing that's going to be important is the inverse of this, I guess, right? So then you can just solve for c, okay, because that's going to give you x over alpha to the one over eta, okay. Um, so so that's kind of how it works. You can map between x and c either at the aggregate or the per product level, and when you do it, it's it's per product. Uh, is small x also from a Poisson? Um, yeah. So it it yeah. It, so the thing about Poisson is, is 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 it's it's additive. I think that's the right word. I mean, if you have um, n Poisson processes running at rate lowercase x, the overall rate will be capital X. These are independent, um, memoryless, and they they won't happen at the same time for small x, right? So 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 what I guess what I'm saying is that the the sum of Poisson processes is itself Poisson, and the rate is just the sum of the rates. Okay, so that I forget that's like a Levy stable or something. I don't know some name for they're having that property. Exponentials also have that property. Um, this has that property. Okay, uh, and so then everything still works out nice and nice and uh, convenient. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that that's 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 the argument here is like okay, we set up it in a particular way. Which seems kind of plausible, um, and that gives us a sort of this this independence across product lines. You can describe things purely at a product line level, and then later on, if you want, aggregate them. Okay. For us, uh, we're just going to call this um, instead of carrying around this function here. I'm just going to use um, c of x. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use x and c of x as our sort of variables when we're doing like a value function stuff. Okay. Um, and that, that should be, it's, it's just better than carrying around artificial parameters and stuff like that. Okay. 
Um, so this is like, this is, this is C of X here. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, okay, that's, that's the new part, basically, uh, uh, what we're dealing with. Okay. So now we're, we're in pretty good shape. We have, we have firm profits. We have the research production function for incumbents. Okay. So now we can write down the value function. Okay. So I'm going to take this kind of like from the top, you know, talking about an aggregate firm value function. And so the firm value, okay. So the firm value, basically uh, their state is N. The only thing that's important for a firm is how many products it has. And since all the products are the same, there's no, yeah, we don't have to worry about this. It's just they have end products. Okay. Now, and so we're going to have firm value is going to be capital V of N, V sub N. Okay. Uh, so let's write down the firm value function. So we know what these things should look like generally. First, you got your interest rate times the value minus the derivative. Okay. That's just like a standard left-hand side of the value function. How much are they pulling in? Profits, n times pi. Okay, so each, this is pi without the tilde for now. So this is also unnormalized. Uh, total profits are gonna be number of products times the profit that they make on each of those, all right? Now, now we have different things that can happen. And there's basically two things that can happen in them. They can lose a product. That one's relatively simple. They can lose a product and they can lose any one of their products, right? So each of their products we're gonna, okay, so tau, tau is the creative destruction, right? Okay, that's borderline legible. Um, tau is creative destruction. So these, these firms, and, and tau is gonna be linked back to X and, and entry at some point, but these firms are, are you know, you're, you're getting incoming shocks of, of other firms innovating and stealing your products. And the, the rate is tau per product line, okay? And so then, uh, the total rate is going to be n tau. And this, this gets back to that, that additive property of Poisson, with that we need that to be able to do this, okay? In discrete time, this would be a disaster because it's like, what if I lose one product? What if I lose two? What if I lose three at the same time, right? But in continuous time, it just, yeah, adds together. So that's that's a really good thing about continuous time. Um, now, and if you're simulating, you could still lose a couple products in rapid succession, right? So simulating, with discretized time, it still it still is realistic. Okay, you can you know, firms lose multiple products over a year period, and that would still be true here. Okay, this is just a, for getting the value. Okay, now what happens if they lose a product? And then, well, they lose a product. They become a v minus v n minus one firm. And remember, when we do value functions, you have the rate at which the thing can happen. Um, actually, this should be a plus. plus yeah sorry I, my notes are slightly wrong but i get to the right answer anyway so this should be a plus it's saying plus this thing can happen at rate n tau if that happens you start having value vn minus one rather than value vn this is going to be negative in here and so then like that's why i kind of accidentally put a minus sign. this thing is going to be negative though okay it's worse to have fewer products okay now that's the creative destruction event. The other event that can happen is that you succeed at innovation, okay? So now this one's gonna be a little sort of like a sub-maximization, okay? So we're gonna maximize over capital X, okay, and I'm writing a super huge for emphasis. Um, okay, you're running a little innovation lab here, okay? And you're actually running N, of, or you're running, well, you're running a big lab, we're saying for now, and then once we sub in for the cost function, we'll see it, it reduces. Question, when we say X is a flow rate, we mean that it is a flow variable that can be evaluated over a time interval T, correct? Not that it's a time, that's correct. So it's it's a it's a flow, it's an event that, that over a short time period has probability of happening delta, the width of that time period times the rate. Yeah, so that it's not a it's not a, a flow as in like investment in solo model is a flow into capital, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yep, so, Okay, so now, so we're running like a big research lab here at the firm, okay? And what, when we choose X, okay, that gives us like an event that can happen, which is that we gain a product, 
Okay, and note, note that here, again, because it's continuous time, we only ever jump up one over, over infinitesimal time interval. And I'm, I'm not doing, I, I could have started this with like delta approximate and take the derivative, but I'm just gonna go, go all the way right away. Um, so this can happen at rate capital X, you gain one product, okay? And then you have to pay W the wage, which is common to researchers and producers of C, X, N like a conditional whatever however I wrote it okay so that's well okay that's that's the inverse of this that'll also give you a CX conditional on it okay so uh, da -da -da, bit of that and a bit of that okay so this is like the research side right so we're, we're doing a little maximization here but it's it's all sort of like you know we could we could combine this all and put it in the huge maximization but that's so that's fine for now. Okay, so this is our, like our true firm level aggregate uh, value function. Okay, and then the other thing is kind of implicitly we need to know, well, what if, what if V is zero? You know, if we plugged in V zero here, we'd get like a V minus one. So we need to cut it off at V zero. And well, at V zero, you don't have any products, you're done. Okay, so you have value zero. So that would show up in the V one equation right here and, and provide a boundary condition. Okay, so with that, we have a pretty well-defined system here, okay? Now, uh, we're gonna wanna simplify this, okay? You, know, you could throw this in a computer and well, you'd at least need to normalize by Y, um, otherwise it would be a little funky. Um, so let's, yeah. Um, but also we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna invoke the fact that we know that we can kinda separate things at the product line level, okay? So we're gonna <clears throat> guess a functional form, and I think this is called an, an ansatz, possibly, um, I don't really know. Uh, we're gonna guess this, that it looks like this, that Vn looks like n times V, this is lowercase v, a number, basically, a fixed number, times y. Okay, so the what we're saying, we're, we're doing two normalizations at once here. One is that it's, it's just some number time, like some number times uh, n. Okay, that's it's like additive linear across n, and we're saying it also grows exactly with y. So, so, um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I guess v could be a time varying function too. At this point, it's fine. And in fact, the way I do it here, it, it's fine. Okay, so n v possibly time varying, but normalized because we have this y here. Okay, so. Um, all right, so so now we can. It's just really just a matter of plugging this in here and canceling and realizing that everything is, is great and happy. Okay, so what if we do that? Well, we're gonna get r. Okay, and then n v y. Okay, uh, for v dot. Okay, we want to be careful here because v we're allowing for v and y to grow. So the way I'm gonna derive this value function is it's not. It, it, we're gonna derive a value function that could be used for out of steady state dynamics too. So that's why we have to allow for v potentially to be time varying as well. Just, it picks up the, the transient component. Okay, so um, what's the derivative of V? So it, there's gonna be two terms, one from V, one from Y. They're both gonna have uh, N out front because that's constant. So first, derivative of the first times the second plus, which is actually a minus, uh, the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna divide and, and normalize and it'll, it'll all work out happy, okay? So that's the v dot term here, including both of x. That's the rv term, n pi. So this is, we can call this n pi tilde times y. Okay, to pull it, we're factoring out that y instead of uh, pi, now it's pi tilde times y. Okay, well, we wanna get a y, we're gonna get a y in every turn, term and also an n and cancel them. Okay, plus what? n tau. Now what is vn given this? Vn minus one minus Vn is gonna be minus Vy, right? So when you lose N, you just lose another minus Vy. Okay, that's so there's a minus inside here. Okay, and then uh, max, we're gonna keep this as this for now and we're gonna divide later, uh, capital X. Um, well, yeah, let's keep, we'll keep it as capital X for now, yeah. Vn plus one minus Vn. That's the the same thing except in reverse. That's gonna be V times Y. Okay. 
uh, minus W C of, well, I guess, oh. let's do the same thing we did here. W tilde, W tilde Y C of X conditional on M. Okay, so that's what we got. Um, now I'm gonna argue that each of these, it's clear that each of these has a Y except for this one, but when we divide, that turns into a growth rate, which is fine. They all have Ys. Uh, we're gonna divide by N. That Most of them have N too. These have capitals that are gonna get uh, per productized when we divide by N. So what we're gonna do is divide by NY, okay? To kill off those normalization factors. And what we're left with is, do a bit of scroll in here. Let's do a little bit of page adding after here, okay. What we're left with is um, RV, cool, minus V dot, excellent, minus uh, V times, uh, well, Y dot over Y. That's gonna be, we know that that's a growth rate, okay. Uh, pi tilde. Cool. Okay, so this one, uh, there's an N, there's a Y, and actually it's gonna be a minus, it's gonna be a minus tau times V. Plus uh, max over X. Okay, so here, you know, we're gonna get like capital X over N, which we're gonna normalize in a bit. W tilde, and then like C of X over N. Okay, so when we normalize by constant, when we divide by constants, that just passes through the max operator. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Okay, now it's just kind of like a couple last last things we need to worry about, uh, which is what? Okay, so R V is the same. That's good. Cool. B dot. Excellent. V, and then this is G. Okay, so remember. Um, G, well, okay, yeah. Let's go back here for a second. So remember why, yeah, uh, y is equal to QP. So so it's it's GY for sure, okay? Whether GY is equal to GQ, which we're calling G, will depend on whether P is moving around, whether we have these transient dynamics. You know, we, we remember this first year, <clears throat> we're not gonna have transient dynamics in P, right? In fact, we're not gonna have transient dynamics here. Let's face it. Okay, so um, unless I don't know, we might in certain cases. Like if if there was stuff actively moving around, like parameters or something, maybe you could get it. So safest thing, say this is GY for now. Okay, and then we can invoke steady state later on. Okay, so that's GY pi tilde. I did slip into an accent there briefly. Uh, minus tau v. And then this one, we're just gonna kind of like note, okay, this is lowercase x times v. This is still w tilde. And then this is the c of x, right? Lowercase. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, we can, we can combine some discount rates, combine this one, this one, and even tau, which turns into an effective discount rate. So then we get r minus gy plus tau, okay, um, is it, uh, no, in V, all important V, and all important V dot, is equal to pi tilde plus max over X, XV minus W tilde C of X. Okay, so that's our value function. Okay, that, it get, we got an effective discount rate, V dot term, uh, flow value of pi, and then this like extra sort of option value of having a lab where it's like you might get success, you're paying in a cost, and it's got to be positive because you could always choose x equals zero and shut the thing down, but it's going to, yeah, so it's going to be some positive number, and like, yeah, the higher V is, then the more positive this is, but then there's sort of a fixed point in this whole thing, okay? Um, yeah, so then there actually are conditions. 
uh, so so suppose that you decided that v dot was going to be zero, we're in steady state. Okay, even then there are conditions for v existing because it's like if v is higher, then you do more research and the value of this lab is higher. But then that goes into v, and you need to make sure that it doesn't explode. There are actually some fairly weak conditions under which that that'll hold up. Okay, but those are not one hundred percent always true. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is, this is your value function, right? And then uh, first order condition for x. Okay, this is going to give you your innovation rate. Okay, there's the first order condition coming off of this thing. It's just v, lowercase v, is equal to w tilde times c prime of x. Okay, so the higher v is, the higher c prime of x should be, which means this is a convex function, strictly convex, meaning this is an increasing function, so it gives you a unique x innovation rate that scales up, potentially non-linearly, with uh, the value, okay? That's where the eta, David, I think I'd ask about eta, you know, um, we need, for c of x, you know, we need eta greater than one, sorry, less than one, so that this is a convex cost function, okay? So that, that's eta, it's gotta be less than one. Okay, so, um, that's our value function. I'm like really confused about my mouse here. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so that, that, that gives us X. That gives us the incumbent rate of innovation. Okay, that's kind of a new thing, All right? And uh, now we can from here we can we can we can go pretty quick, right? So now we need to know what's up with entry. Okay, so we're gonna we're still gonna have a free entry condition, all right? Um, we're still gonna have a free entry condition. Uh, did I use? We didn't use gamma yet, did we? I should have used gamma. Okay, I'm gonna do a slight audible here. Uh, so the free entry condition. What happens if you enter? Ah. Um, can you briefly say how to know to guess functional form of Vn? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how Clutter and Quartum did it when they did it, but you know, it's just like, I mean, once, you, once you're here, okay, you're looking at cost and, and production functions, you can see you can express things that are per capita level, okay? Which is to say that like, if you can map if you can map from cost at a per capita level to innovation at a per capita level, that means that like there is this separability. Like if these exponents were just like you know alpha, beta, or whatever, different different than some to one, this whole thing would fall apart. You, it's like if you have non-constant returns of scale in a production function, Kyle Douglas, you're going to get some other n-related term here. All of a sudden, it actually does matter how big your firm is, even if you're looking at the per the product line level. And it's like, you know, maybe there's a bunch of labs and some labs have some idea and they tell you about it and you're like, oh, that's great. Like, you know, there, there's non-trivial interactions between the labs across different product lines. Then yeah, that that's that's a case where you get non-separability. And then because of that, this whole thing would fall apart. So how do you know? I mean, it's sort of like you see there's this kind of separability here and the separability kind of means like linearity in this case because the marginal effect of having an additional lab doesn't depend on N, right? The marginal effect is just V times Y. So that's sort of like the intuition. I mean, <clears throat> sometimes you uh, you know, you just gotta like brute force it. Sometimes you know. I mean, we we had a paper um, looking at basic research wherein firms could uh, be in a bunch of this glove. By the way, is just like so we can write more easily. Uh, came with the the tablet, not some like weird thing. Um, so I mean, it is weird, but it's 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 normal weird. Um, so. Uh, we we're, we we're doing this basic research paper where you could be in different industries and like there were spillovers and the more industries you were in, the more you could capture them. That introduced like some element of non-separability and we had to like try a hundred different things to, until like finally we figured out what to assume in order to get like this whole process to work again. And it was a little bit more complicated, but it's just like, it's like solving like, you know, some mi middle level differential equations. It's like, do you throw a T on the front of the X? the exponential and hope that it works, right? It's kind of like that. Um, so there's no perfect, there's no like silver bullet uh, in, the, in that sense. Okay. Um, all right, so 
entry. Yep. So if you enter, you enter as one product frame. Okay, so you enter V1, where V1 is, is just V times Y. <clears throat> now, what's our, uh, if you so an entrant, like, and, and there's a, the, the, the pool of potential entrants is infinite. And so they can decide one, like, little firm lab, you know, entry lab can decide they want to give it a shot. And if they do that, um, they get some rate of uh, entry gamma successful. They get a rate of successful entry gamma per like unit of research used. Okay, so then the the benefit is going to be that rate of success gamma times the value of success uh, vy, um, and that should be equal to their cost, which here is just w. So that's the wage that you pay to the researcher. Okay. All right, and then that's cool because you can just move the W over and you get gamma V equals W tilde, right? So that's our free entry condition right here. Gamma V equals W tilde. Um, maybe I should have written V tilde, but you know, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's pretty much it. Um, in the notes, I called it chi, but chi is weird because it looks like X, so I went, went for gamma. Um, all right, so that's going to pin things down. You know, once we get the value function, so it's not going to be like in the simpler models where we can we can solve it in closed form because this is like a recursion relation here. You know, this is like a implicitly defined value function. Not too hard. You know, it's just a single equation if if we're in the steady state, but it's it's not closed form, right? So we'd, we'd find that v, plug it in here, see if it works, okay? And then we know that w just going to scroll up real quick here. We know W is related to P, so we can we can keep track of P and W and all that, okay? All right, so, um, and then uh, I guess what else is there? So there's, then there's the labor market. What's that going to look like? Um, one, that's the total amount of labor is equal to P plus R. And then we know that we know P. If you if you want it scrolled up, you can see it's some function of W tilde. You can track P, you can track W tilde, it doesn't really matter. Now R, um, who's doing R? Well, firms are doing R. Uh, and they're spending, they're hiring C of X researchers, right? So there's a unit mass of product lines, right? Each firm per product line is doing C of X research. Uh, can you explain the right hand side of free entry is W? So, the, you know, you're you're like one little firm. You're an entrepreneur. You're like, okay, look, I have the idea. I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if you're like. Anyway, you, you need a researcher, right? You hire a researcher, right? Um, doesn't matter who has the idea. So you hire a researcher and pay them wage W. Okay, so that's um, that's your cost. Right, that's like your marginal cost, right? Uh, or like your, your total cost, doesn't matter. Let's say you just hire one person, wage W um, is your cost, and then your benefit is the probability of success times the, the value of success, okay? The reason, and then, then this is uh, wage is equal to the production wage, because we're assuming you can choose freely between production and research, which is kind of like, like this, basically, okay? Um, all right, so then there's UMS product lines, they're each doing, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's marginal benefit equals marginal cost, where the margin is like in, you know, individual labs, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, there's UMS of labs, they each are spending C of X, the firms are spending C of X, C of X per lab, there's UMS of labs, so the total is C of X, in fact, as well. Um, now for entry, uh, what's the total here? Well, they're they're each um, the rate. Let me think. It's just e. I think I I might have I put this 
my no, I didn't even put it in the notes. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so what's what's going on with entry? So they're spending. I'm making sure this is right. Yeah, this is right. So they're they're they're, they're hiring e. Uh, you know, each entrant is hiring one researcher, and so there's e a mass e of entrants. This is an equilibrium object, and so this is just e, right? So then each of these e spends w. The benefit scales up with e again, sort of a Poisson notion, um, right? And so then that that's just Okay, which is our, our the, the equilibrium variable representing the number of entrants. Okay, now the way actually, you know what? I want to change this slightly. So I want to be consistent with how the how cladding chords do it. I think so. So there, there's a distinction to be made here. Um, one is we're going to say that E is the, the rate of entry. Okay. E is the rate of successful entry. Okay. So then, um, the sort of like R for entrance rate is going to be E over gamma. Or and maybe it's more intuitive to say okay, well the rate of successful entry, successful entry e is the probability of success times the number of researchers out there R sub e. That's got to be true, okay? So then what we put in here should actually be e over gamma, okay? So then if if um, gamma is really high, the probability of success is very high. For a given rate of entry, you're not spending that much because these these researchers are really good come up with new ideas, okay, and vice versa. So this should, this should be E over gamma. This should, it's a notational thing, but, but I wanted to make E the actual rate of entry because that's going to be more convenient later on, okay? So now this is, um, what's the relationship between R and C of X? So so this is, okay, so the, the, what I did here is I basically split R between R incumbent and R entrant, okay? So R incumbent is just C of X, okay? So, so C of X is, is the total amount of incumbent spending because there's a unimass of product lines. And then R E is entrance spending. And then you add those two together to get this R here. Okay. So this, this, this here, right here is R and then this is P. Um, Poisson is characterized by just gamma, which is why we can do this. Yeah. So, so pretty much. Um, gamma is the rate of success at the, the individual level. And, and, it, and again, you need the, the independence, the additivity across Poisson to, to, to really get there. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, I mean, you've got our E researchers, entrant researchers, they each have a probability gamma success and that gives you a total rate E. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, so this is our labor market clearing equation. I mean, it's it's important. It's, there's not much we can do with it, right? We're gonna guess. We're gonna be like guessing this stuff and hoping it works and evaluating whether this holds up, right? This is really just gonna be solved in a computer. But this is our like consistent. We need this to be true. This is gonna be one of our equations, okay? Um, okay, growth. So. We need, we need growth. Uh, yeah, turns out it's gonna be the same as always, same as before. G is log of one plus lambda times tau. What is tau? Good question. Uh, tau is the total innovation rate, which is gonna be X plus E, right? So each firm is innovating. Uh, fancy labor market, yeah, it is. Yep, this is our, this is our labor market clearing condition. It's, yeah, it's just got a bunch of different factors in it now. Um, so the total innovation rate tau is like incumbent. Each firm is doing rate X. Each product line is doing rate X. There's a unit mass of product lines. They're independent. And then there's a total rate E of entry. Okay. And each of those does like one innovation. Okay. So that's it. Um, if you want, you can call this, you know, lambda tilde. Just make this lambda tilde. I don't know. It's useful for me sometimes. Um,
Okay. Uh, right. And so, so this, the derivation for this, I mean, we, I think I must've done it in first year. Um, if you're, yeah, if you, if you want to know that I, I can, I can let you know. Um, it's, it's just, uh, you got a tau rate of some increment happening of, uh, and then because the Q is log log aggregated, you get this log of one plus lambda. It, if you want to go over that, I'm happy to go over it later on, but I think for now, let's just take this as given and then, and then see how that goes. But this is going to tell you, this is how fast Q is growing. This is, this is like GQ, which is that log log aggregator. Okay. So this will give you that, that aggregation there. Okay. Um, all right. So let's do, so that's pretty much it. I mean, okay. How, how, now the question is how do you solve this? Okay. What we're going to do is construct a system of equations. Okay. Now any, any time you do this, you can think about it as a graph. You've got starting points, which are your equilibrium variables, and you're just mapping out what can I find with each of those, and when, how do I get to con, uh, equations that constrain those variables? Okay, so like wage might be constrained by the labor market clearing condition. Okay, so here, higher wage is going to increase W. It's also going to decrease X. Probably will decrease E as well in, indirectly. Okay, um, and this will be some complex equation. All right. So think about it. Um, Okay, uh, what do we need to know? We need to know, okay, so so first let's, um, you know, this we're looking at steady state right now. Okay, so in steady state, we're, we're gonna know that like gy is equal to g, for instance, and then v dot is equal to zero. So that makes our life a lot easier on the value function. Okay, so then this is just r minus g, which is actually just, given log utility is just uh, the discount rate. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to get some equations. All right. And yes. Yeah, so, and then R equals rho plus G. Okay. So then um, given that, all right, we're going to have rho plus tau times V is equal to pi tilde plus this thing. This is like our value function. Okay, so this is like an equation basically. Okay, that's one. I'm not gonna write the labor market clearing condition again, but that's that's another one. That should be true. These are like kind of stuff that we can't quite solve. Um, free entry. Entry, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is, remember, this is like x plus e. That's a simple equation there. Okay, so these, these are some things that have to be true. Now, what are our, um, these are equations. What are our variables? Equal variables. Uh, we need X, we need E, we need G, we need W tilde, we need V. Okay, that's five, that's a lot. So what it, we need some more stuff. Okay, so this, this is labor. Labort, I don't know what labort is. Let's take care of that. Uh, C of X as well, yeah. So, um, well, I was thinking that the the free um, first order condition. So, what do you mean by feasibility? Um, so, I, I was thinking FOC on X, which which told us uh, V is equal to W tilde C prime of X. That, that's what you're talking about. Okay, so. Yeah, I mean, but it, with regards to feasibility, I mean, like, it, it is true, yeah. And then, it, it, I mean, there's other stuff that I'm, like, kind of ignoring. It's like, you know, this should be, I guess it's implicit. You know, you can't have C of X going above one or anything like that, okay? So, um, okay, so that's four. So this is, like, kind of linked to X. This is kind of linked to, like, V. 
So, oh, you know what? Well, okay, so we don't need to know. Do we need to know G? We don't really need to know G, do we? It's not showing up anywhere. That's that's why. Okay. So because we assumed that G was, that we're, we have log utility, then actually, that's it. So we have we got four. Four equations, four unknowns. Incumbent rate, entrant rate, the wage, and the value. Okay. And it should satisfy, essentially you can, you can, this is these are all these these equations are not separable of course but like you know this is kind of like v relevant this is w tilde relevant this is x relevant and then this is x and this is e relevant so yeah you can see there's a, there's a clear kind of like semi diagonalization wherein it's like these are most relevant for for their particular equations but of course uh e and x show up in the v equation they all show up in the labor market they show up you know anywhere uh, v shows up practically everywhere. Okay, so they're not they're not separable. Okay, so we got four equations, four unknowns. Does that mean they have a solution? No, not necessarily, but it means there might be a solution, um, and that's what we're banking on. Okay, so uh, you know, yeah. Maybe you could prove it. I don't know. I'm not. It, once you get past a certain level of complexity, it, be, it becomes both like prohibitively difficult and like not even necessarily that useful. I think to show formally uniqueness and existence, but it's still a useful thing occasionally. Um, now the other thing is uh, helpful to know whether like do people actually show existence and uniqueness in the real world? Um, for that, uh, yeah. It, yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, it's actually pretty impressive. Like sometimes people show existence for like really complicated models and it's like they go to a lot of work. As my, my old advisor, Dirk Kruger said, you know, you finish the model, you got you read the code and you realize you have to prove existence and there goes like a month of your life. And it's like... That's a big cost. Um, so, but there's a lot of papers where they don't prove existence because it's just, it would be insane. Okay, uh, so it's not a requirement, but it's it's something that people actually you know depending on the culture, depending on the sub subfield, they they will do. You know, uh, uniqueness is usually pretty tough, um, but it happens. So, um, okay, so then uh, that's how you'd solve it. You code up, you know. And, 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 you know, sometimes it's like, you you know, you need to like calculate in, intermediate stuff. Like you need to calculate this maximum analytically and plug it in and you need to, I don't know, plug in here for, yeah. So th this one's really fairly straightforward. But the other thing is like, you know, th this is what I would call, there's, there's a notion of like the rigidity of a system. I think it comes from like engineering. Okay. Um, which is like, th this is kind of overspecified in a sense, right? Th this is more equations than we really need, right? So, uh, so, so the, the easiest way to see that is like, think about V and W. Like we know this, all this says is that V and W are proportional, right? Anywhere you see V, you could uh, sub in W, which is W over gamma, right? They, so we, as humans, we know we can, we can trivially reduce this to at least a three system, three variable system and get away with it, okay? And so, you know, we, we could we could go down that road. It, it, numerically, it's actually sometimes better to keep it like a little slack, you know, so that you don't get like things changing, moving around too quickly, right? So numerically, it can actually be better to just start here and leave it here. But if you wanted to, um, you could say, okay, well, we know, to combine these two equations, right? We know, I don't know which one, let, let's cancel, um, let's cancel w yeah we should probably cancel w no because we need w here i mean well but one one thing you could do is say that okay so we know that v over w tilde well on one hand v over w tilde w tilde is one over gamma from this equation Let's move those around. Then V over W tilde is also C prime of X. Okay. So now we know one over gamma equals C prime of X. That means we actually know what X is. We've solved for X. Okay. 
and then we can plug it in here. We can plug that in here and in here. And actually this is just, now this just becomes like a thing, a number that we calculate, not even really a maximum. Uh, and then we, we can solve for V. Okay, because now that once we know exactly what X is, it's not a max anymore, we can subtract uh, solve for V. Okay, so then we could we could solve for V star actually analytically. Um, or no, oh, but we need to know E. Well, whatever, okay, let's not do that. So, but, but that equation becomes quite a bit simpler, okay? Um, Yeah, so, so what that would do is that would kill off x and it would kill off equation four. So then we'd have a system in E, W tilde, and V, okay? Um, and then if you look at the labor market equ equation, right? Suppose that we knew x, and because remember now we know x, right? Um, again, here we, you know, now it's just a relationship between W tilde and E. Right, so like if we knew e, we could find w tilde, right? Um, and if we knew e and w tilde, we already knowing x star, we could actually find v, okay? And then if we knew both of those, we could find this and and solve for the entry equation. So so what really what we do is say okay, guess e. All right, and from E and the labor market clearing equation, we can get W tilde, okay? And then from the combination of E and W tilde, this is why I'm saying it should be thought of as a graph. From the combination of E and W tilde, and I'm gonna circle this because it's like a source. From the combination of E and W tilde, we can get V, okay? And then combining W tilde and V, we get, you know, like entry, the entry equation, free entry really. Okay, and we'll put that in a box because it's like a sink. Okay, so so in fact, if you do that substitution of finding x star and and using inverting the labor market equation, you can make it a one dimensional system in E, where you you guess E and see if this thing holds up, if the free entry condition holds up. Okay, and then uh, that's cool because well, there you could you could show existence, right? Evaluate everything at e equals zero. See what it looks like. Evaluate it equals something large, um, and see what it looks like, and and just argue that it's continuous and it should cross. You could show um, existence in this setting. Uh, uniqueness is going to be more difficult. You'd have to take a huge derivative, and it'd be a disaster. But like, you could show existence um, with that with that method. Okay. So so this, but this is a highly rigid system. You change E, it has all sorts of propagation effects that are gonna change this entry equation very suddenly and kind of rapidly uh, and in a kind of unknown way, not potentially non-monotonic way, right? So that's gonna confuse a solver. Now, sometimes it's worth it to get down to one-dimensional system because it's just way easier. But if it was like going from like a 10-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system, once you're in two dimensions, solvers get much more easily confused than in one dimension. And so it's like, maybe you should reconsider that. Okay, so that those are some trade-offs. They're really practical trade-offs. There's not, not a, a rule that you necessarily can follow, but it's something to be aware of, okay? Um, okay, so maybe we should uh, take a break now, okay? I'm going for an hour 20 here. Uh, I wanna take a 10 minute break. Come back at um, 4.30 and keep going after that, all right? So I am gonna relax here. I'm gonna mute my, I'm gonna mute my mic and go into spaceship mode and I'll be back at 4.30, okay? See you then. All righty. Um, let's get started. If you all are back here. Um, okay, so we, yeah, sure. Fire away.
Um, yeah, uh, it is. I mean, it's stochastic. It's not stochastic at the aggregate level, but um, it, whatever what happens to a firm will be. Yeah, maybe take it. Yeah, uh, let's see. So I guess where are we taking expectations? I mean, we are. If you go back to the value function, like uh, here, even yeah. I mean, so this is sort of an expectation, in a sense. Okay. So, but but I mean. What, how would we do this? Yeah, you know, okay, so, so think about it like this. When we write down the discrete time value function, we do take sort of expectations. We, we write like, you know, there's some <clears throat> probability delta times n times tau that you get hit with a creative destruction shock. And then there's some probability one minus delta n tau that you don't, okay? And then we add up over all of those simplify, divide by delta, and eventually we arrive at something like this. Okay, so those are that, that's our expectations. Those are approximate for small delta, okay? But they're still expectations. Um, you could do the full on Poisson, like what's the expected number time, the expected, what's the probability that, happen, that you lose one product, that you lose two, or whatever. So you could, you could do that, but it would be really complicated, and eventually it would reduce down to this in the, in the limit, okay? so. Um, that that's really where we are taking expectations in terms of what's happening to the firm idiosyncratic events that are happening to firms at that level, and then um, I think that's it. I mean, when we do distributional stuff in a second, I guess we are also doing that, but it's like there's we're, we're aggregating over um, a bunch of product lines, and so that that it sort of factors out. Okay, um, but yeah. So let's do let's do that. So 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 we kind of have the notion of equilibrium. We can solve it basically in a couple different ways. Okay, so let's say um, we want to find the firm size distribution. Distribution of the D distribution. Okay, so, um, second. okay, uh, I should switch to the whiteboard. Okay, firm size distribution. Okay, so here, what are we going to get? So we're going to define mu n is, is basically a distribution. It's the mass of firms uh, with n product lines. Okay. So that's, that's our main object of interest. Okay. Um, so we want to write flow equations for that distribution mu n, okay? Uh, and we can do that, right? So we can we basically, with any of these equations, we, are, we do have to distinguish between n equals one and any pot, and any n greater than that. So we can start with n equals one. So for mu one, okay, so what's the, what's the rate of inflow into uh, firms with uh, one product line? Well, that's just, um, I forget something. Uh, one second. Yeah, okay. So what's the, I'm gonna screw up the notes a little bit, but hopefully it works out. Uh, what's the rate of inflow um, uh, into those product lines? Well, there's gonna be entry. Okay, so when a firm enters, they're gonna become a, a one product firm. So we'll have that. Um, and then it might also be that a two product firm loses a product line. Okay, so there's there's a mass uh, mu two of firms with two product lines. Um, they lose them at rate tau, and then there's two of them, so you actually have to write two tau. So there's, each of those has a rate tau 
of, of getting stolen. And so the total rate for them is two tau. Okay, so that's that's a little tricky, but that's it's gonna be true there. Um, and then <clears throat> the outflow is tau times mu one. So you're you have one product, it's one product line firm, there's mu one of you, and you can lose that at rate tau, in which case you actually exit as a firm. Okay, so we won't call that it's not gonna be mu zero, but it, you're gonna exit as a firm. Okay. Now um now for general mu n, okay, it's gonna look similar, but there's not gonna be any entry term. You're just gonna have n minus one, okay, times x mu n minus one. So this is saying there's mu n minus one firms that are one one step below. They each have n minus one products that are being, uh, and you're adding a new one at rate x. Okay, so like this is their capital X for n minus one firms. And this is the mass of them. Okay, so you need to have the baseline mass the number of products you're dealing with, which is usually the number down here too. Um, and then the rate here of gaining products is X. So this is like incumbents gaining new products X when coming from N minus one. Um, that's the inflow. Okay, and then you also have from, from below, I'm gaining one. And then you also have N plus one times tau mu n plus one. Oh, sorry. Um, what about the one product firms that innovate? Uh, oh, yeah. Good point. Forgot about them. Okay, so yeah, you're going to have entry coming down from two and then leaving either because you go down or you come up. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, that's that's I totally forgot about that. So then, um, okay. So then, uh, yeah. So that that should be mu one. Then mu n, um, you're gonna have uh, firms that are one product smaller that innovate. Firms that are one product larger that um, uh, lose a product. Then you'll have this. You know, basically the same things leaving. Okay, so you'll have like n x mu n and then n tau mu n. So so let's see, three products. Yeah, that's a zero. Yeah. So that's gonna that's gonna be on the order of delta squared. So if we were to write this out, sorry, and this should these should be should be that's if we were to write these flow equations out in discrete time, those would all be uh yeah, delta squared or, or smaller events. Yep. Um so they'll 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 still be that's like it's still accounted for. You can still just have to have, have have them one at a time, basically. Okay. Um, okay. So then, cool. Uh, so we got that. Now, uh, so these are flow equations, and I mean you you can combine these in the tau plus x if you want, but you know whatever. Um, so those are flow equations. Uh, these we could use if we were doing an out of steady state analysis. We could use them to discover how things will move around, you know, exactly. Um, but we're going to mostly look at steady state. Okay. So we can just say, okay, well, these should be, these should be zero. Okay. So let's say that these are zero. There we go. There. Steady state. Okay. So um, now what would that give us? Well, I guess we can <clears throat> say, okay, like that first one, so if n equals one, that first one, x plus tau times mu one, like this this term over here, x plus tau times mu one, should be equal to e plus two tau times mu two. Okay, um, <clears throat> similar kind of thing. Uh, n times x. Well, okay, let me let me put the n on the next to me. So x plus tau n mu one is equal to uh, you know, this whole thing. Let me, I'm gonna reorder them for a purpose that you'll see in a second. X n minus one, mu n minus one, plus tau n plus one, mu n plus one. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. And then uh, one thing you can do, I guess I should, I'll reorder this one too. So this is gonna be like tau times, 
one thing you can do is note that you you only ever see mu with its attached n. So this is one times mu, one. This is two times mu two. This is n. This should be mu n. n mu n n minus one mu n minus one here n plus one mu n plus one. You only ever see them together. So we can define mu tilde n to be n times mu n. That's going to make it a little bit easier to solve. Okay. So now and so what is this? This is this is the product distribution. So it says how many products are owned by firms with n products, right? What's the mass of products in total, right? Um, so there's n stationary distributions. What do we think of it? It's just one recursively defined. So it, there's there's one recursively defined distribution. So so yeah, uh, there are n numbers, I guess, but there's one recursively defined distribution, and we're going to be actually able to solve for it explicitly. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so then, and if you if you summed all these up, you they they would sum to zero because, um, actually no, the, the, these wouldn't sum to zero. If you summed the equations all right in a second up, they would they would sum to, to zero. Okay, so, um, let's let's do that. So let's put things in product length terms. So mu one is actually equal to mu one tilde because n equals one, e, and then this is tau times mu tilde two, so this is just that portion right there. Okay, then x plus tau mu n tilde is equal to x mu n minus one tilde plus tau mu n plus one tilde. So this is good because now we got rid of any n's. We, we only have like constant stuff, e basically e and tau, okay, and x. Remember, remember tau is equal to e plus x, that'll be useful later on, but we can leave it as tau for now. Okay, so um, we, we have just like constant coefficients here and this like system of equations, okay? Um, yeah. And uh, let's see how does that work. Yeah, okay. Um, what would happen if you summed all those up? I don't really know. Yeah, okay. Um, so then uh, we can use now these, okay, and, and try and discover a solution there, okay? So what we're gonna do is kind of guess a functional form and then plug it in and see what happens, okay? So we're gonna guess, um, let me see, who should I use? I have to make sure I, I got this right. Okay, so uh, we're gonna guess a functional form from mu tilde n, which is, let's say a times b to the n. Should we do n minus one? Uh, n minus one. Okay, so then mu one is a, mu two is a b, mu, two, mu three is a b squared and so on. Okay, so they're gonna guess this geometric form, okay? And then hope it works out, all right? Okay, so that's gonna give us basically two, it's gonna give us n equations, but really it's just gonna give us two that are gonna be fairly redundant, okay? Um, and the, those two equations, so the, the, it's gonna give us n minus like a bunch of equations here, but they're all gonna be equivalent, okay? And then this equation is gonna be the other one, right? And they're gonna determine A and B, okay? So if we plug those, a this guess in we're gonna get x plus tau mu one is just a is equal to e plus tau mu two which is a b okay so this is an equation it's it, they're not separable okay so we have a and, and also b in here but we'll be able to take care of that eventually um, I guess. Yeah, there's a, we should also have that mu sums to one. So maybe, yeah, no, we can deal with that when we get there. Um, and then this one says x plus tau a b. So this is mu n, so it's mu uh, to the n, sorry, minus one is equal to what? x a b n minus two plus tau a b 
to the N. Okay. Um, all right, so then what we can do here is, uh, scroll down a bit first. Uh, let's cancel out those B to the Ns. Just, so keep, keep this one on ice, that'll be equation one. Um, Let's cancel off these b to the n. So the, the, because the b to the n's all the all cancel, uh, these these equations become redundant. The n equations become redundant. So this is b uh, over b squared plus tau a. Okay, um, and then you know we probably want to just kill kill off a b or add on a b squared term just to make it all sort of positive coefficient. So this is a b equals um, x a plus tau a b squared. Okay, so this is like equation two, all right? Um, and actually, the a cancels on this one. Uh, so x plus tau b is equal to x plus tau b squared, all right? Um, so now we can, we can, uh, figure out from this one, we can figure out B. Okay. Uh, and then once we know B, we can plug that in here to get A. Okay. So let's solve for B. Okay. So this is a quadratic equation. Okay. So this is saying zero is equal to tau B squared minus x plus tau b plus x. All right. Um, okay, so that should have a solution. So it's going to be well. Let's. Let, I think that this is going to factor. Okay. Um, so the uh, b squared. So the think about the discriminant b squared minus 4ac. Okay, so clearly this is something going on here. And it and it turns out, you know, this is it's gonna turn into x minus tau squared, basically, because it's gonna just reverse that sign. If you want to see it, x squared plus 2x tau plus tau squared minus 4x tau. Net there is gonna be x squared minus 4 sorry, minus 2x tau, minus 2x tau plus tau squared, which is equal to x minus tau squared. Beautiful. So our discriminant is fact is is a it's a perfect square. So, no, not, not perfect square, but it's, we know what it is. We know we know exactly what it is. Okay. So then um, uh, let's see. So then that means that b is equal to. So let's just go through it. Negative b plus tau plus or minus, so then there's the square root of the discriminant, so that's just x minus tau. Nope. Over drawing straight lines is very difficult. I guess I could, I do this, that's better. Um, and then over two a, so that's two times tau. Okay, cool, so one of these is gonna be positive, one's gonna be negative, obviously we want the positive one. Page, okay. Um, okay, so if we add them together, we get 2x over 2 tau, which is x over tau. If we subtract them, we get 2 tau over 2 tau, which is 1. So we want the, the minus 1. So, so subtracting, sorry, we want the adding 1. So, so adding them together, we get 2x over 2 tau, which is x over tau. Okay, so this is our solution. For B, okay, kind of had to go down a little bit of a dark alley there, but we came out on the other side alive. Uh, B equals X over tau. That's good. That's a good, good, simple number there. All right. Now we need to take that B, plug it back in up here, and solve for A. Okay, so now you can see um, if B is X over tau, then that's going to cancel this tau. It's going to give us AX. Okay, so. Uh, so, so the, this equation one, x plus tau times a is equal to e 
plus tau AB. Tau AB, which we now know is equal to E plus X times A. Okay. And then the XA's are going to cancel. We're going to get tau A equal to E. And that implies that A is equal to E over tau. So that's just beautiful, I think, because, you know, B is X over tau, A is E over tau. In fact, A plus B equals one. Um, so, so it turned out to be a relatively coherent solution and it'll, we can, we can try to interpret once we plug everything back in. So we have A and B. Cool. Okay. So now we can find mu tilde. <laughs> So I should say I totally botched the derivation in the in the notes and I had to redo it, but it, it happens that it worked out like possibly even the exact same way somehow, but I'll go and, and update that with the proper derivation. Okay. It looks pretty similar though. So then um <clears throat> okay. Scroll a little bit. So was it A? So then this is gonna be E over tau. So it's A B to the N minus one. So then this is X over tau to the N minus one. Okay, so that's our that's our solution. That's it. Okay. Um, wait. Oh, I, I missed. Uh, sorry. I did, uh, basically, the Poisson distribution here is a magical distribution, like the extreme value in the trade. Yeah. Um, Poisson is pretty magical. I think. Yeah. It, you could say that. I think um, part of it is like, yeah, everything ends up being proportional. The big thing is the proportionality to n. That allows us to construct mu tilde that doesn't depend on n. It only has constant coefficients, and then it's just like everything kind of balances out. But Poisson is quite magical. Um, now, the uh, let's see. So from here, okay. So so note that like this is um, you know if you plug in for tau, this is e over e plus x, x over e plus x the n minus one. So this is like all e and x stuff, right? If you, if you wanted to, okay. And it also has the property that if you um, if you sum this, it's going to sum the one, right? The sum of this thing from n equals one to infinity is just, uh, okay, let's say this is like delta, then it's one over one minus delta, okay? So, um, so one minus this, because tau is e plus x is e over tau, so one over that is going to kill off this term. So this is guaranteed to sum to one because tau equals e plus x, but you can see it here too. This is guaranteed to sum to one because of that, you know, our summation of the delta n minus one from n equals one to, inf to infinity is equal to summation of delta to the n from n equals zero to infinity, which is equal to one over one minus delta. Okay. So, and that, that gives us this, that this sums to one. Okay. So that means... This guy sums the one, which is good because there's a there's a unit mass of product lines. It should sum the one. If it didn't, something would would be wrong. Okay. All right. Um, now the cool thing is we can get mu n. So mu n is just one over n times e tilde n, right? It's just one over n times e over tau x over tau. All right. It's a very simple game. So uh, we have a geometric component, geometric decay from this. Each n, you, you add on another x tau factor, OK? And then we have uh, this n component. So, so it's really it's saying that the, what's geometric is the mass of product lines, and then the firms are just 1 over n times that. Um, and then like, so, so here you can kind of see if, uh, Let's see, if epsilon were, sorry, not epsilon, E were to go to zero, then this would go to zero, that would go to one, this would go to zero. Okay, so, um, not clear what, yeah, so, so if you go to one, if he goes to one, things kind of break down, okay? Um, if he goes to infinity, then, uh, what happens? Well, this is going to go to one. This thing's going to get very small. And so it, it'll, it'll just be a super compressed, but almost every firm will be a size one. If you go to infinity, you're just, you're getting constantly just clawed at by these entrants and you can never make a big firm. 
okay? E is relatively small. It's going to spread out a little bit more. You're not going to have as much entry pressure. Okay, that's going to allow for larger firms. Okay, so um, and then the fact that it's out here is just sort of make sure that things add up properly. Okay, so um, yeah, that's what's going on. So we can solve that analytically. That's a cool. I think is a cool thing about cutting core team is you can actually get this stuff analytically. Um, there's some other stuff we may want to know. Okay, so we know this. Um, this is our, our functional form here. So it's our distribution here. Uh, we can also find F. So F is the total number of firms. Remember, this sums to one, right? But we don't know what mu n sums to. Mu n actually just sums to something. And that's the total number of firms. If this is the distribution of our firms. Total number of firms. That's supposed to be a capital sigma. The total number of firms. That's not, not good either. Let's, let's get a good one here. That's okay. Uh, n equals one to n of mu n. Okay, that's the total number of firms. Okay, so that's going to be sum of 1 over n e over tau e over tau k minus 1. Okay, so what is this? Okay, it's not immediately obviously, immediately obviously, it's not immediately obvious what that is. Okay, um, <clears throat> but we can figure that out. Okay, so, so the question really is if we go over in the sidebar in, in delta land, what is, uh, what's the sum of 1 over n? Let's say we just want to find this. What is that thing? Okay. Um, so that's, turns out we can do that. All right. Uh, so if you think, define h of delta as the sum from n equals 1, 0, 0 equals 1 to infinity of delta to the n. OK? Um, let's do n equals 0. n equals 0 to infinity. OK? Um, all right, so now this this is our our function. So we can integrate this. From, so like delta prime delta. Okay, so what if what if we integrate that? Why not? It's a sum, we can integrate each individual one individually. If we do that, we get n equals zero to infinity uh, 1 over n, wait, plus 1, delta to the n plus 1. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so we get that. That's pretty close to what we want. Okay. If we, if we shift the index from n equals 1 to infinity, we get 1 over n, delta to the n. Okay. So that's, that's our integral there. Okay, and that's that's what we we're looking for actually. One over n delta to the n that sum. Okay, but we also know that this is this sum here was originally that h function is just it's just one over one minus delta. Okay. Um so we can integrate that too. So it's, it's also true that the integral of zero delta this thing here is equal to the integral of zero to delta of one over one minus delta prime. Okay, um, and we can do that. Okay, so that's uh, a log one minus delta. That's a log of one over one. Whatever. It's the okay. So if you if you were to Take the derivative of this, you get one over one minus delta, and then the minuses would cancel. From zero, delta. I guess it should be a prime. Okay, um, and then finally, at zero, this is one. So then it's actually just minus log of one minus delta, which is log of one over one minus delta. Okay, so it turns out you can kind of just integrate it and find out that it's log of one, one over one minus delta. So that is, you know, 
equal. That's what this is. These two are both the integral of h of delta, and they're equal to each other. Okay, so so that's yeah. You can actually take a derivative of h delta to get positive power sums. Okay, you can go in either direction. You can do it on an arbitrary number of times in principle. It gets. I mean, doing it in this direction is a lot harder because integral of the log is x log x minus x, which all of a sudden gets really out of control. Okay, but you can do it. Um, okay, so then with that lengthy aside set up, we can now do this. We can now figure out what the sum is. Okay, so this, um, if we want to make it look exactly like 1 over n delta to the n, we need to factor out the e over tau. Okay, uh, one second. We need to factor out the e over tau. I just somehow erased that, e over tau. And then uh, also this my x over tau to the minus 1, which is tau over x. Okay, times sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the n. Okay, so now we have everything set up. So this is e over x. Okay, and then this is going to be log of 1 over 1 minus x over tau. Okay, uh, which we can simplify a little bit. So that's e over x log of uh, tau over tau minus x, which in fact, we can simplify even more because tau minus x is just e, so it's tau over e. Okay, so we can actually find the total mass of firms if we want. Maybe that's interesting. Okay. Um, okay, and then uh, yeah. So one thing you'll note generally with all this stuff is that really the only thing that matters is the ratio of e to x, the relative value of entry to incumbent innovation. The absolute values never matter; they always cancel in every in every setting. Right? There's all these relative rates. Okay, so everything is relative and then the sort of the the rates will scale up growth but they won't necessarily change the distribution too much okay um all right so that's cool uh you can find other stuff okay i talk about it a little bit in the notes i won't go over it too much right now okay um but but yeah uh and then the notes Somehow everything in the notes, the answers I get in the notes are all exactly the same, even though I missed like two different terms in the flow equations. I don't know. It's just one of those magical things. Okay. Um, all right. So so that's that's pretty much it for in terms of cladding quartum. Um, the uh, I have a little bit on simulation in the notes. Okay. Um, I already, I already went over some of that, but like essentially, like you can. Um, If you want to simulate stuff, just instantiate a bunch of firms with uh, uh, values for the n according to this distribution. Okay, uh, so the value we might want to target. Yeah, um, let's see. So the the number of firms that's that's kind of tricky because it's 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 not it's kind of scale free and unitless. One thing you can do is let's see. You could look at the average firm size. Okay, so remember the um, there's one mass of products, right? Per total of f firms, so the average firm size is one over f. Okay. That, or the average number of products per firm. That that might be something you want to target if you if, if you had product data. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and and actually, you know, if you wanted to look at like average revenue of a firm. Okay. Well, that would be just be n bar times the revenue per product, which is actually y. We know that from the demand function. Okay. Um, so you, you could do that. You could do average revenue 
for firm and then into like normalized. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's still unnormalized. But um, for instance, if you, if you wanted to find, it's a good example. If you wanted to find like the, the let me think. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of something that would be more interesting. I mean, you could you could look at uh, something like the the variance. Okay, you could calculate variances from these. Okay, um, and look at like the the variance divided by the mean. So, so you, the problem is like <clears throat> with f, it's not there's no units. So it's not clear what it means. Okay, you could turn that into number of products per firm that gets closer to being united, but uh, still we don't have a clear definition of what a product is vis-a-vis -vis the data. Um, but then if you looked at like um, a, a normalized thing like the expectation of n squared over the expectation of n, that's the coefficient of variation for n. That might be a thing that you could calculate in the data and would. You know, assuming products scaled linearly to the data, then that that might be a good thing to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's just allergies, by the way. Uh, so it, you could you could do this coefficient of variation for n, and that might be that might be interesting. Okay. So um, and you, you to get this, you'd have to look at like you know summation of um, n squared u n, which which we actually know is just n times uh, this distribution, which is something, the geometric sum we know how to calculate. Okay, that's actually, you, you just go in reverse here, you get delta over one minus delta. So you could you could calculate that and divide, and then you, you could actually find interesting stuff. Okay, so, uh, but, but f in and of itself, maybe not so much. Okay. Um, yeah, and so to simulate, you, you draw a bunch of firms from this mu n distribution, okay? A bunch of values for n for a bunch of firms, and then you'd say, okay, now stepping in the next delta t, let's say you said delta t was 0.1, stepping in the next delta t, you have delta t times x probability that they gain a product, delta t times, sorry, delta t times x times n probability that they gain a product, delta t times x times, delta t times tau times n that they lose, and then you can just simulate them over time, okay? Now, if you started at the steady state distribution, you would not, and you would hope not to change the distribution, okay? But you could look at stuff like, what's the distribution of growth rates or things like that. So in a model like, and actually in a simple model like this though, you, you can actually calculate like the variance of growth rates. You calculate the distribution of growth rates because um, it's relatively simple. Once you get into more complicated stuff then you really do need to simulate um, and that, that's gonna be an issue, okay? The other thing is, uh, the, the only thing you'll run into, now, when you simulate this, you're going to get a firm size distribution of mu n. That's not going to be um, that dispersed. The, the real firm size distribution in the data is extremely heavy tailed. Uh, this doesn't give you really a heavy tail. It gives you a geometric tail, which is technically not heavy. It's not like a power law. So, you know, this gives you, this gives you, um, you know, not x literally, but some x to the n, or like one over x to the n. I might call it x to the minus n. Uh, a real, um, it's kind of heavy. It's just not as heavy as you see in the data, I guess. Uh, so I guess like a Pareto. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the data you see much more variance in terms of the, the size of firms, like a coefficient of variation. This this would be much bigger in the data compared to the model. Um, but even so, if you're simulating this, you know, the, these probabilities, are they're looking like delta times x times n. They're looking like delta times x times tau and stuff like that. Um, you want these to be less than one. And in fact, you want them to be a lot less than, you want to be like in the point 0.1 range or something. You want these to be relatively small. No, that x times tau. Uh, this should be delta times tau times n. So you want these to be relatively small. The problem is that 
if you did get a really large firm, this might get too large and your probability might go above one, okay? Which can be, is not good, right? Um, so you want to set, you want to set it so that like delta times x times n, like max, like n hat is like less than one. So you want to set a maximal n potentially so that these probabilities are less than one, okay? For any n. Uh, the other thing you could do is break it up. You could say, okay, well, let's just draw this delta x n different times. And then that would be consistent. That's again, because the additivity, because of the additivity of Poisson, you can break it up if you want. Okay, so those are those are implementation details, but that can be it can be important. Okay. All right. So that's kind of that's Clevin Corton. Okay, so um, we can so in terms of stuff that you might want to target, stuff like this that will characterize in a normalized way the variance you see in the distribution could be good, okay, in the, in the firm distribution. That could be useful. Um, other stuff which you might need to simulate, um, you can do it. Uh, like the, so, so there's some stuff you don't need to simulate. So let's say you were interested in R&D over revenue at the firm level. You know, that would just be like, that would be like N times C of X. It'd be like what, W tilde, and C of X, that's the total R&D spending, okay? And then the revenue is N times Y. The N's cancel, sorry, so actually this would just be W. The N's cancel, so you get W tilde C of X. Okay, so this is like your R&D intensity. How much R&D are you doing relative to your revenue, okay? So first of all, that's gonna be constant across firms, uh, which is not true, of course, in the data, but that's an implication of this model, okay? Um, so that's stuff you can target. You can target the aggregate growth rate. You know, that's that's computable. That's you know from from everything, you, and you can get data on that. Um, that would be that you know that's an aggregate though. So it's maybe it's better to target micro data. You could target the average firm growth, okay, and things like that. Um, yeah. So you you can for 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 most anything you'd be interested in a firm. You could you could you could do. So you, generally though, you want to look at growth. Like how much R and D are they spending? Okay. Maybe the correlation between those two. Uh, you want to look at um, employment, how, mo how many people they're employing, what's their profitability, and so on. Okay, and you can you can get all of that. And I'll tell you, like the profitability. Remember, like pi over y. That's you know, like total profit of a firm divided by total revenue. It's n pi over n y, which is just pi tilde, which is lambda over one plus lambda. So if you if you were looking at average profitability that's going to tell you about lambda. Okay. Now with profits, you also want to subtract off R and D spending too. So maybe, maybe it would be more like that, but um, yeah, so you, you can get sort of like profits, you know, uh, normalized in an appropriate way, R and D normalized in the appropriate way uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff. And that'll tell you, you, know, you can get an idea for how that's going to inform you on these different parameters. Okay. So, there's no 100% right answer for that, okay? But but you can kind of intuitively see what should be important. Okay, so um, now, so that's that, that's pretty much it for cladding quartum. I do have I, I wanted to talk about the the more advanced cladding quartum. All right, so uh, we have we only have about 15 minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm a little bit time compressed here, but. Um, yeah, should we do this? So, I mean, a lot of this is is combining stuff that we've already done. Okay, so this is like, this is like heterogeneity in like at product level, product heterogeneity. Let me scroll here. We need a new page. So the thing about cladding quartum is that all the products are the same, right? Um, we might want to add in something like heterogeneity, like some products are better, some have higher or lower productivity. That's already true, but some might have higher or lower profits and everything like that. Okay, so 
if you, if you want to do that, you remember with expanding varieties model, we had this aggregator where you had epsilon mediating how substitutable things are between the different products. So, um, yeah, so, so we can go back to this, okay? Go back to this in a cutting quartum style setup and see what happens, okay? So when you do that, you're gonna get different values for profits. So when you do log log, you get limit pricing. When you do this thing, as long as epsilon's less than one, you're gonna get that what you do is contingent on your, your productivity on QI. So remember YI equals QI times LI. All right, so you're gonna get something different, okay? Now, I, I've already, we, we already went over this last time, so I'm not gonna rehash it, but let me tell you what we find, okay? What we find is this, we find profits, normalized profits. Okay, so, for, so first of all, we need to find our aggregation. Um, So we have this, when we do this, our appropriate Q aggregation looks like this. Okay. And we're gonna define Q hat I to be Q I over Q. Okay, so that, that that's all sort of scale free. We, we're moving into like Q hat space, right? Um, and so then every we can characterize everything in terms of Q hat, okay? So pi of q hat this is the, the okay. uh, my mouse just like disappears. Okay, so then pi of q hat is gonna be epsilon times q hat raised to the one minus epsilon over epsilon. Okay. So once we um yeah, so you know if you if we go to we, we can't really go to epsilon equals one because then things get kind of wacky, but um, for any epsilon less than one, this is gonna be a well-defined thing, okay? You can, and then you can look at like, um, you know, li, you want labor utilization. It's gonna look like this. Uh, same factor there. So th this is actually, it's like l of, the, l of q hat, okay? so. Essentially, your, your rel this is your relative productivity, okay? You, you, each product line has a QI, a productivity. There's an aggregated one like this, and when we divide those, we get your relative productivity, okay? And you can define, you can get your profits in terms of that, okay? So that makes things a lot more interesting because now it might be that firms want to improve their own product lines. That's not something we've really done thus far. Because uh, if you think of, you're a, yeah, I mean, if you're, okay, if you're, if you're in the, the Cloud and Quartum world, okay, you, you can, you could improve your QI and that would, you know, increase your Lambda and you, you could probably work that out actually. Um, but I figured we, we may as well just go fully general here with elasticities. Okay. So if you, if you allow for this, gonna get this just like an, this is basically exactly like an expanding varieties okay um, and then if you think about value so go back think about firm value again um, it's gonna be something that's a function of Q hat okay so uh, we have what um, so so now, and, and sort of implicitly on top of this, we have cutting quartum going on in the background. So now like what a firm is, isn't just N, although N is important. It's really like Q1, Q hat one through QN. A firm is a portfolio of products, but now each of those products has a particular relative productivity. And that, that's important, that's material for Profits. Okay, so, so things get a little bit more complicated, but we can still kind of subdivide everything 
and think about it at per product level. So we're going to get something like, you know, our V of Q hat. We're going to get a little V, but that V is going to be a function of Q hat. And so your total, your total V of like some Q portfolio is going to be the sum of V of Q hat times Y, I guess. Uh, you know, QI from N equals Q from I equals one to N. Okay, so your total V is going to be the sum of each of these scaled up. Okay, and so if you do that, uh, you're going to, let's see. I'll show you what you get. All right, so you're going to get like R minus G, which you normalize and speed. I guess I guess I should write explicit Q dependence here. Okay, so you're going to V of Q hat as a little V. V dot Q hat. Okay, that's going to be equal to, you know, like pi tilde Q hat. All right, and then we need to kind of decide like what else is happening. Okay, so you're going to have creative destruction going on still. Okay, so it's largely similar still. We just have this Q hat that affects profits. Okay, um, and then we can have the same external innovation term, right, that we had before. So x of v bar minus w tilde c of x. Okay, so here v bar, you know, because you're getting it at some random product line, it's the expectation. Uh, heterogeneity comes from the fact that finally good producers use intermediate boost differentially. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so they each, yeah, so the final good producer, I didn't write it, but they're going to, well, okay. So, so the final good producer sees the intermediates as, as uh, the same, the symmetric, but because they have different productivities, that's going to result in different outcomes for things like profits. So, so higher, higher productivity products are going to give higher profits, which wasn't, which isn't the case with limit pricing, right? So that's, that's the basic idea there. Um, but but in terms of how they treat them, it's, there's no weighting or differential weighting here. It's all coming through the product the the production side. Okay. Um, so all right. So this is, this is our value function, kind of like mapping what we had before. R minus G. You got a tau term. You got a profit term. External innovation. So this this is just saying sort of the expectation. V bar is like the expectation of V of like one plus lambda times Q. So you take the expectation of what would happen if you chose a random product line and incremented it by one plus lambda. Okay. Um, so that's that's more or less the same. Okay, but with V bar. All right. And then um oops, sorry. Uh yeah, so so at this point we, we've kind of just like replicated um cutting quartum with the possibility of, of heterogeneity in Q. Um, the other thing you can do is you, you could actually say, well, what if what if we added in another thing called internal innovation, which was Z? Okay, so what would that look like? So essentially, let's say you let's say you chose Z, okay, and when you spent so essentially Z is gonna increase your own productivity. But like proportionally, so 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 what I'm saying is like uh, Q hat dot is equal to Z times Q hat, which is to say Z is equal to the growth rate of Q hat. So you you basically choose a growth rate for for your own Q, and that's Z. Okay. Now I need this. So, I need this. so you choose a growth rate for your own Q, and that uh, according to Z, and you're gonna get a derivative there. Okay, so when you when you make continuous choices, this is kind of like the big new thing. Uh, when you make continuous choices, you're gonna pick up a derivative term. Okay. Um, 
make sure that I'm doing this right. Yeah, you're gonna pick up a derivative term. So you're changing, this is like q hat dot. This is v, the derivative of v with respect to q hat. Okay, so that's what it went, you know, if you, if you do the discrete approximation, you can derive this, but essentially you're, you're inducing a certain change and you just need to value that according to the derivative of v, okay? Um, so that would be your benefit and then your cost is gonna look similar. It'd be like w tilde times some cost function d of z. So that's the internal innovation cost function. Okay, so I just added in like another feature of a research lab, which is that it can improve your own uh, innovation. Okay, so now, um, yeah, so now th this is all, you know, I mean, you can, you, know, you can simplify this. This this would end up being rho plus tau v minus, you know, v dot is equal to pi tilde plus these, you know, terms here. Okay, so you can you can kind of simplify it a little bit more with the Euler equation. But that's what you get. Okay, and then you can you can plug that into everything else. Everything else is is pretty similar. Okay, and then and then solve for it. Okay. The uh maybe I'll go just a little bit next time I'll talk about like the finer points of this in terms of implementation. Um but that's that's going to be your your new value function. Okay. Now, um the other thing is distribution. Okay, so we know n, n is actually gonna look exactly the same. You know, so mu n is gonna look almost exactly the same. Okay, because things still happen at the product line level. Okay, but we may want to think about the distribution over q hat, which now is a little bit tougher to think about. Okay, um, and essentially what you can do is this will be the last thing I have time for. So let's say f of q hat is your the CDF, okay, of your q hat distribution. What's happening with q hat? Uh, q hat is because it's divided by the aggregate q, you shrink it down or you, you shrink things down if they don't innovate, and then when they innovate, they jump up and then they shrink back down again and then they jump up. So q hat is going to be some distribution there. Now, um, what's that going to look like? So you can think about what's the derivative you can do it like we did with me what's the derivative of f of q hat for a particular q hat what's going on there all right um and uh well um it, it turns out that uh there's two things going on so you know think of think about um some distribution like this okay and we're looking at some point there's, there's two flows here. One flow is that, you know, if, if, if the, let's say there's growth coming from G, right? So, so Q hat is Q over capital Q. So if G, if Q is growing, that's gonna push Q hat down, okay? So let's say it's getting pushed down up here. So you're gonna have things that are kind of getting pushed across that boundary, okay? And that's gonna be proportional to basically sort of like G Okay, uh, times Q hat. So like basically the flow, G times the value. So that's that's Q dot basically, times like how many how many products are in that region. So the density at that point. So the density here times like the flow is going to be the change in the CDF. Okay, um, and then uh, you're going to be losing stuff because it, it might be that there was a product here that jumps over here with that factor one plus lambda, okay? But if you were over here and you jumped up here, you'd still be less than Q hat. Remember, we're looking at the CDF. I think less than F, that less than Q hat. So if you're between Q hat and Q hat over one plus lambda, you're going to jump up above. You might escape. So that's going to be minus tau, the rate at which products get the creative destruction shock times the mass in here, times the mass in that escape zone. So f of q hat minus f of q hat times one plus lambda, all right? So this is gonna be an equation characterizing f, uh, or like if you set this equal to zero, that characterizes it. And actually, yeah, this should be, 
This should actually be G minus Z because Z is, is pushing against Z, against G. So Z is pushing this up. G is pushing it down. So it's the net effect of, of G minus Z. Okay, so that's that's what this will look like. So then in steady state, you know, your equation is gonna look like this. Equals tau. Okay, so then this is a... Uh... Okay, so I'm, almost, I'm out of time. Okay, so, but this is a, this is a differential equation. It's, it's a non-local one because you're referencing points that aren't even at Q hat anymore. Um, you see this sometimes in like biological diffusion models and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's not, not really, it doesn't really fall in the standard kind of like stuff you see out there too much. Okay. Um, but you can solve these. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the... The way the way that you do it computationally is a little bit different. This this is true, like symbolically, but but the way that you do it computationally might be a little different. Okay, um, maybe we can talk about that later. But um, these these are these are solvable. So you can figure out okay, given all that's happening, what is this this distribution? Okay, so um, all right, so I think I'm out of time.